These days, you're more likely to give someone your website address than a business card, so you may already be comfortable with the notion of sharing your images online. A web gallery can serve as a virtual portfolio or as a vehicle for clients to review images, among other purposes. In this lesson, I'll show you how to create a custom web photo gallery that is built on HTML. If you don't know what HTML is, don't worry. All you really need to know is that a web gallery built on HTML can be viewed with a web browser without the need to download and install special plugins or other software. I've already created a collection that contains only the images I want to share in a web photo gallery. So in the library module, I'll go to the left panel and scroll down to the collections, where I can click on the collection that I want to use for this web photo gallery. I'll then switch to the web module so that I can figure the layout for my web gallery. You'll notice right away that my preview area shows only a single image even though I have 10 photos in this particular collection. The reason is, on the toolbar, I have the option set to only use selected photos. So in this case, the first thing I need to do is click the pop-up and choose all film strip photos. Note that we can include only selected photos or only flagged photos as well, which is helpful in certain situations depending on how you're working. Keep in mind that we can choose a collection of images from the left panel in the web module as well. We don't necessarily need to start this process from the library module. I can then scroll up on the left panel to choose the template that I'd like to use as a starting point for my HTML gallery. Note that in the preview pane, there's an indication in the bottom left corner whether this is an HTML template or a Flash template. If I mouse over any of the other templates, you can see that the preview is updated to reflect that particular design. The script F indicates that that template is a Flash template, which contains different capabilities and different options. Flash templates will be covered in a separate lesson. Now that I've selected the images that I want to use and the template that I'll use as a starting point, I can hide all of the panels except the right panel. So I'll press Shift-Tab to hide all panels, and then click on the stub for the right panel to make it visible. In this case, I'm going to go ahead and make use of the solo mode for this panel just to simplify the display. To do so, I'll right-click in an empty area of the panel and choose solo mode. On the Macintosh, remember that if you're using a one-button mouse, you'll need to hold the control key and click to access this right-click feature. In solo mode, only one pane of the right panel will be visible at any given time. Whenever I click on a new pane, that pane will become the only one that is currently expanded. All the others will be collapsed. I'll start off by adjusting the site info settings. These are all relatively straightforward and mostly relate to titles that will be visible within the web gallery. So I'll name the overall site with my own name, and then I'll give the collection a particular name. In this case, they are wheels photographed in the Palouse region of eastern Washington, so I'll give it the name Wheels of the Palouse. I can also type in a description if I'd like for this particular gallery. Let's go ahead and put a little play on words here, and we'll say photos found around the Palouse region. I can also enter contact information, that's relatively straightforward in this case, and of course a web or mail link. Since I'm going to include this web gallery on my website, instead of a web link, I'll use a mail link, which needs to be preceded by mail to, and then my email address. The identity plate is an option found in all of the output modules and allows us to apply some branding to, in this case, a web gallery, but also to printed images or slideshows. If we turn on the identity plate, it will be added to the web gallery layout. And of course, we can choose a different identity plate if we've created more than one, or choose Edit to bring up the Identity Plate Editor so that we can make changes to the Identity Plate. In this case, I'm simply going to turn the Identity Plate off. Note, by the way, that you can also have the Identity Plate link to a specific website address or to another email address. Next, I'll configure the colors for this web gallery by clicking on the Color Palette pane. As you can see, there are a variety of options, all of which relate to specific elements within the web gallery. For example, if I want to change the color of the primary text, I can click on the color swatch associated with it and choose a new color. I can similarly change the color for any of the elements of this web gallery. In the Appearance pane, you'll find settings that relate to, of course, the appearance of your gallery. We can turn on a checkbox to add a drop photo to the images if you like. Keep in mind that with a dark background, that drop shadow might not be visible. We can also enable or disable the section borders, 
which in this case separates the title for the site from the other details on the page, and naturally I can change the color of that as well. I can also specify the layout for the grid on the image. In other words, how many images across and how many images down. This will specify not only how many images on a page, but how many pages are required for the gallery based on the number of images to be included. If you'd like, you can turn on cell numbers. In this case, the cell numbers are actually turned on, but the text for numbers is set to the same color as the background color, so they're not visible. If you actually want to see them, you'd need to go change the color palette in this particular case. You can also place a border around each of the photos in the gallery and specify a color for that border. There are separate settings for the pages that contain individual images at a larger size. The first determines how large those images will appear. In this case, I'm using 450 pixels, but I can set a larger or smaller size. Of course, that size is a little meaningless when I'm not seeing the actual effect. Well, I can click on one of my thumbnail images in the preview in order to actually see that preview and make a better decision about what size I might want to use. If I then drag the size slider to the right or left, the size of the image will adjust and I can see the preview updating on the fly. I can also determine whether or not I want a photo border for this larger image and specify the color and size for that border. The next pane is Image Info, and this allows us to specify whether or not additional information about each of the images should appear with the image. The options are Title and Caption, and we can configure settings by clicking the pop-up and choosing Edit. This will bring up the Text Template Editor, which allows me to specify particular metadata values or custom text that I would like to use. In this case, I haven't added a title to the metadata for the images, so just so that we can see exactly how this feature works, I'm going to instead insert the file name. I'll then click Done, and as you can see, the file name appears above the image. In this case, that file name isn't exactly the most attractive part of the web gallery, but it will enable clients, for example, to communicate to me about exactly which image they like. The Output Settings pane contains settings related to the images that will be generated for the galleries. For the large images, we can specify a quality. You can think of this as a percentage, though it actually relates to the JPEG quality settings. Simply adjust the slider to change the overall image quality. I generally use a value of around 80, which is a good balance between file size and image quality. We can also determine which metadata will be included with the images. The options are copyright only or all metadata. I prefer to use the copyright only option so that all the details about the capture of the image, my keywords, etc. are not shared with others on the web. The watermarking feature allows us to put a simple watermark on all of the images. This watermarking feature is available in all of the sharing modules. That includes the slideshow, print, and web modules, as well as the export feature. When this option is turned on, you can simply choose the desired watermark from the pop-up list, or choose Edit Watermarks if you want to create a new watermark. Once I've selected a watermark, as you can see, it will appear as designated in the image. In this case, my name at the bottom left corner of every image. I can also apply sharpening to all of the images, and I encourage you to do so. The algorithms are actually very sophisticated in Lightroom 3, and it will improve the overall appearance of your images. With sharpening turned on, you can choose low, standard, or high. In most cases, standard will produce a good result, although in some situations you'll want to use a different option. For example, for portraits I would tend to use the low setting, and for high detail images I would tend to use the high setting. Note that the sharpening effect is not shown in the preview here in the web module. The final section of the right pane is Upload Settings. This is where we're able to configure the server settings so the web gallery can be uploaded automatically to our website. You can simply choose Settings from the pop-up or click Edit if you need to create new settings. In this case, I have some fake settings established so that we can take a look at the Configure FTP File Transfer dialog without me actually showing you my login information. For server, simply enter the domain that you would otherwise use when logging in to your server. You may need to get this information from your internet service provider. Enter your username and password, and check the box if you want to save the password in the preset. Note that it is stored as plain text, so if you're working on a computer that's not secured, you might want to turn this option off. You can then specify the server path where you'd like files to be uploaded. 
If you had entered actual server information, you could click Browse to navigate the folders on the server in order to determine which path you should use. The protocol should generally be left to the standard of FTP on port 21. The protocol port and mode settings should be left at their defaults unless your internet service provider has indicated that you need to use different settings. Note that we can also choose the preset from the pop-up and either save the current settings as a new preset, delete the current preset, or rename the current preset. In this case, I'll go ahead and click Cancel, since I have another preset that will actually allow me to upload images to my website. We can also choose to put the images into a subfolder, and I actually always recommend using this option, because that way you can configure your FTP settings using a higher level folder. For example, you could create a Galleries folder and then place the individual web galleries into a special folder. So for example, I can turn on Put in Subfolder and then type a name for the folder that I'd like to create. In this case, I might call it Wheels, for example. Now that I've finished configuring all of my settings, I can press Shift-Tab to hide all of the panels and Shift-Tab one more time to bring all of them back. Then I'll move over to the left panel and create a new template based on my changes to this existing template. I'll give this template a name, in this case maybe gray and gold, since that's the colors that are used in this particular template, and then click the Create button to save that template in the User Templates folder. When I scroll down the template browser, you'll see that in the User Templates folder is my new gray and gold template. In some ways, this lesson is a little deceptive, in that it makes it seem that creating a web photo gallery can be somewhat time-consuming. The reality is that creating a web gallery can be incredibly fast. For one thing, here I'm explaining all of the various options for configuring a web gallery rather than simply applying my desired settings. But also keep in mind that once you've created your preferred settings and saved those settings as a template, the process of creating a web photo gallery involves simply selecting the images to include, choosing the template you want to use, fine-tuning a few specific options such as the gallery title, and then uploading the gallery to your website. Besides the ability to create HTML-based web galleries, which we've covered in a separate lesson, you can also take advantage of the power of Adobe Flash technology to create web galleries that are more visually impressive and interactive. The only thing to keep in mind when creating a Flash-based web gallery is that it does require support for Adobe Flash. That may require visitors to your web galleries to install a special plugin before they are able to view your images. Having said that, the majority of users are using a web browser that already supports Flash. In this lesson, I'm still working with an HTML gallery I've created previously, and we're going to use this gallery as the basis of exploring some of the potential of Flash-based galleries. In the template browser found on the left panel in the web module, we can scroll through to look at the various templates that are available. When we mouse over those templates, we can look at the bottom left corner of the preview to see which ones are Flash-based, those indicated by a script F, and which ones are HTML-based, those indicated by the letters HTML in the bottom left corner. We can choose any of the Flash-based templates to get started in taking advantage of Flash for our web galleries. If you've explored HTML galleries, then you probably immediately recognize that the preview for this Flash-based gallery is a bit different. It has a scroll bar within the thumbnail preview area, and if you click on an image, you'll notice that there's a transition effect. These are some of the many capabilities that Flash offers. Before delving too deeply into the settings for a gallery based on a Flash template, I want to show you a couple of additional special Flash-based galleries that are included in Lightroom. These special Flash galleries are found in the Layout Style pane on the right panel in the web module. These include Airtight Auto Viewer, Airtight Postcard Viewer, and Airtight Simple Viewer. As you can see from the preview, these include special capabilities that create a very interesting user experience. In this case, I'm able to scroll through my images in a very interactive way. The Airtight Postcard Viewer is even more interesting. Here the images get laid out like virtual postcards on a desktop. We can click on any of these images to zoom in and get a closer look, and click again to go back to the collection of images. The Airtight Simple Viewer, as the name implies, is a very straightforward viewer. Thumbnails on the left and a preview image on the right. 
simply click on a thumbnail to see a different image. For each of these airtight options, you'll find different settings available in the various panes of the right panel. Similarly, if we use a flash-based gallery, you'll find additional options that are a little bit different from those for HTML galleries. Most of these settings are exactly the same as the ones you would use for an HTML gallery, as we've covered in a separate lesson. However, you will certainly find some additional options. For example, for flash-based galleries, you'll find a controls background color and a controls foreground color. That controls the various control buttons that you'll find within the flash-based gallery. For the airtight options, you'll also find additional settings that you won't see for HTML-based galleries. For example, the airtight auto viewer includes options related to the borders and the padding for the images. Borders, of course, is the size of the border around each image, and padding is the space in between each of those images. The basic process of creating a flash-based gallery, of course, is quite similar to that of creating an HTML-based gallery. In essence, the process is the same, but the final result can be quite different. The bottom line is that with minimal effort, you're able to fine-tune the gallery to your liking to produce a great user experience. As you can see, creating a flash-based gallery is really no more complicated than creating an HTML gallery. There are some different options related to the flash-based galleries, but all of them are very straightforward. Provided you're comfortable with the fact that these galleries require a web browser that supports Adobe Flash, you can put the flash-based galleries to use to create a very impressive user experience in your online galleries. Once you've created a web photo gallery using the web module in Lightroom, you'll naturally want to share that gallery with others, potentially even the entire world. Lightroom makes it remarkably easy to preview, export, and upload your web galleries, which is what we'll take a look at in this lesson. I've already configured my web gallery exactly the way I'd like it to appear, and so I'm ready to preview the final result before possibly exporting it or uploading it to my website. You can preview the web gallery to a certain extent within the Lightroom interface. All of the links are clickable, so for example, if I click on this thumbnail image, I'll be taken to a preview of the page that contains that image. I can click on the image or the index link to go back to my thumbnail view. However, it's a good idea to preview your web gallery in a web browser to get a better sense of exactly how it's going to operate. To do so, simply click on the Preview in Browser button at the bottom of the left panel in the web module. When you click this button, Lightroom will process all of your images and create the necessary web pages in order to produce the final web photo gallery. It'll then open the home page of that gallery in your default web browser so that you can navigate around that preview gallery and determine if everything is working to your satisfaction. As you can see, the web browser has popped up and I'm able to review the gallery in a more realistic environment. I'm happy with the result I see here, so I feel that I'm ready to either export or upload my web gallery. The export option is accessible from a button at the bottom of the right panel in the web module. This is the option you would use if you need to generate all of the files and save them in a particular location so that you can transfer them to a different computer, send them to a client, or whatever other purpose you have. You could even use this option for uploading to your website if you don't want to use Lightroom for that purpose for any reason. In most cases, if you have your own website, you'll want to use the upload option, which I'll show you in a moment. The export option is actually very simple. When you click the button, the Save Web Gallery dialog will appear. You can navigate to a folder where you'd like to save your gallery and then type a name. I'll call this Wheels since this is my gallery of wheel images. When you click Save, Lightroom will process and prepare the images and create the files that are necessary for your web gallery. Once that process is complete, you can access the generated files in the folder you specified. I'll switch to that folder now so that you can see the product of that process. You can see that a wheels folder has been created in my web galleries folder, and if I double click on that folder, you can see the content that was created. This includes, in this case, some HTML files, some resource files, and the content, which contains all of the images that are used in the web gallery. Getting back to Lightroom, we can take a look at the final option, which is to upload your web gallery directly to your website. Keep in mind that this requires that you've properly configured the upload settings at the bottom of the right panel in the web module. 
In particular, you'll want to make sure that you've specified a particular subfolder for this web gallery. With everything configured, you can simply click Upload, and Lightroom will process your images, generate the necessary files, and also upload them to your server. This is actually a really big deal. You can simply select the images you want to include in your web gallery, choose a template and fine-tune the settings as needed, and then upload that gallery automatically to your website so that it is instantly available to anyone with internet access anywhere around the world. Note that this process may take a little bit of time, depending on how many images are included in the web gallery and how fast your internet connection is. Once the task is complete, you can open your web browser and navigate to the address based on your upload settings and view your web gallery on the internet. Once you've created and shared your web photo gallery, the real work is done. Next, you can start letting the world know about your latest image gallery and prepare for all the great feedback you'll receive about your photos.